organization called Cure International. Um, you, you can easily find us at cure.org. And we are an organization that set out to establish and operate specialty surgery hospitals and programs for children with correctable disabilities uh, around the world. And we can talk about the strategy of, of which countries we go into and which ones we don't. Uh, but to date, we have 10 hospitals around the world and two programs, one for clubfoot and one for hydrocephalus uh, in about 29 different countries. And I know it's really hard to see, but you can get an idea of where in the world we are. You'll notice right in the middle, a lot of our programs and hospitals are on the African continent. So, as Paul said, um, I've been with the organization for a little, about 11 years now. And in the beginning, uh, really looking at opportunities for CURE to develop new programs and hospitals in other countries, uh, primarily in North Africa and the Middle East. And then somewhere in 2006 and 7, I got really interested in actual hospital management with CURE, and so I went down to Uganda and was only gonna be there for two years, but as these things happen, I stayed for eight. So uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife is a physical therapist, and for a couple of reasons, we decided that we probably needed to do something else uh, for a while, and so we decided to come back to the United States, and that prompted a conversation with CURE, and uh, if there's anything that we can do to be relevant or valuable to help that organization continue to grow and improve, we wanted to do that. So, so I've taken a role with Cure, and it's, a, it's an office of development and sustainability. And as Paul said, it's we're, we're trying to find ways to help an organization that historically has been very donor driven and, and supported through fundraising become much more self sufficient. And that's where we're at today. So. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the network, but really I'll spend most of my time talking about Uganda because that's what's near and dear to me. So, um, and it's where Paul and I met. So a couple of years ago, Paul and I happened to cross paths, and we were asking some of the same questions um, about how to increase access of care for the populations in the countries where we're at, and also make it affordable uh, and sustainable. So uh, we're both trying to achieve some of the same things, and that that led to me being here this uh, last night and today. So. Um, thanks for your time this afternoon. It's really, uh, it's really fun to be here, and uh, I'm happy to, to have this opportunity. So thanks. Uh, how many of you, has anyone been to Uganda? I know Pascal has. Oh, quite a few of you. Um, to Mbali? Wow. All right. When were you in Mbali? Um, I guess about a year and a half ago, a friend of mine worked at the Finric Clinic in Baduda. Sure. So I spent like six weeks out there with her. All right. And that is, is Lisa Humphrey? Do you no. know Lisa? I don't. It was okay. Amber Wilson. Okay. Yeah. And Lisa was prior to, okay. to her. But yeah, I know the clinic up in, up in Baduda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. You're up in the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Did you ever come by the hospital, the Cure Hospital? I didn't there? see Cure, but I know a lot of the volunteers that would come out um, with, with Finric would go out to Cure. Yeah. We, we hosted Jordan. quite a few Finric yeah. volunteers over the years. So. You were in Bali as well? Just for a day. I was working at Mulago in Mulago. Great hospital, Mulago. Mm -hmm. Well, great big hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the hospital, so Cure was started 20 years ago by an orthopedic surgeon. I'll just give you a little bit of context because it's probably important. It was started 20 years ago by an orthopedic surgeon who had been doing some surgeries overseas and realized just a lack of specialized surgery in a lot of countries. And about I don't know, about half of, of all physical disabilities in the world are correctable with, with a single intervention. So Scott began asking the question, if, if it only takes one surgery to really remediate or help a child recover and, and, and compete with their peers later in life, why would we not want to do that surgery? And most of those surgeries are relatively inexpensive. Um, and when you look at the, the return on that, if we can do an intervention for a child or a baby, and they can be a high-functioning adult to compete with their peers, <coughs> It's kind of a no-brainer. So Scott set out to establish Cure 20 years ago. We opened our first hospital in Kenya. Our second hospital was in Uganda. Most hospitals that Cure operates uh, are, are focused on orthopedics, primarily club foot, problems in the legs, spine. Um, however, Uganda is a little bit different. Uh, we, got, we arrived in Uganda in 2000 and quickly learned there was other people also providing orthopedic care. We had a phenomenal American uh, pediatric neurosurgeon named Dr. Benjamin Worf, and Ben uh, agreed to come and help us start this hospital. And he realized there was a lot of untreated pediatric neurosurgical conditions, primarily hydrocephalus. And at the time, there was only one neurosurgeon in the country with a population of about 17 million, and nobody was treating children. 
So Ben started treating all this hydrocephalus by using what we've used for the past 40 plus years uh, with a VP shunt, which is an engineering device. Middle of the brain, goes down to the abdomen, keeps the, the water, the, the CSF off the brain. Everybody familiar with hydrocephalus, more or less? Water on the brain, accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid inside the head. So obviously the goal is to get the fluid off the brain. Um, in the United States, most children that have hydrocephalus, this is a congenital defect. So it's a problem in fetal development. There's either a fetal hemorrhage, fetal stroke, or, or an abnormality that causes his CSF to accumulate. It usually shows up on ultrasounds, and parents in some cases decide to terminate pregnancy. Uh, the children that are born, they usually intervene on day one, so shunts place pretty early on. You may even know people that were treated with hydrocephalus and they have a shunt, goes underneath the skin, behind the ear, down to the gut, and it works. Um, shunts have been used for a long time. Um, the problem with shunts are, is they fail. So in, in 2007, in the North American trials in 2007, half of them failed in the first two years, 80% failed in 10. So it's not a matter of if, it's just when. When a shunt fails, you've got a, a child older than 18 months, the skull is closed, that accumulated pressure has nowhere to go, and so it's a, you have a very short amount of time to seek care. So it's, most parents with children with hydrocephalus that have shunts live close to, um, uh, close to emergency rooms, close to neurosurgical access, um, and when the shunt shows signs of failure, they quickly take them into the, the ER. That works here in the U.S. We can manage that fairly well, although it does change your lifestyle. I mean, I have friends that have children with hydrocephalus, and one of them doesn't fly with their child, one of them doesn't let them play contact sports, and one of them can only live an hour away from the nearest hospital. So it's, it does change the way we live life when you have a shunt. But in places like Uganda, it's, much, uh, it's a much bigger problem. Access to care is an issue. So if you're in, bring up a map, Uganda is not a big country, but it sure does have a lot of people. Apologies. I think I can get this to show full screen, can I? Yeah, there we go. So Uganda is not a big country, but to give you an idea, here's the capital city, Kampala, our hospitals in Mbali. This is about 180 miles, four hours by car. Gulu, you know, epicenter for the war that was happening up until 2003 with the LRA. This is about six hours, six to eight hours, sometimes 10, uh, north of the city. And, you know, all this is basically bush. It's a rural area. So for a patient to get from most parts of the country to Kampala to find a neurosurgeon, just not realistic, um, especially when you, when, you, when you add in the, the reality that most parents won't immediately recognize the signs of shunt failure. When you live in a place where malaria has a very high prevalence, you're automatically going to assume malaria is the culprit. So you treat for malaria, you wait a couple days, and then the child's dead. So that's the problem with shunts is the, the, the amount of time that parents have to get their child into appropriate care is, it's a, it's a short window. So we started shunting all these children and Ben realized he wasn't getting any shunt revisions. So we know they fail. So after a couple of years, why aren't they coming back in for shunt revisions? And the reality is, is he knew the answer is they just weren't surviving. So although shunts work in our setting, they don't work in settings like this. So Dr. Worf knew that we had treated shunts endoscopically. Um, using a rigid endoscope going in through the top of the head, we're able to you know, reopen. Uh, the, the aqueduct is in the, in the center of the brain is a, is a ventricle, and inside of that space is where some of your CSF is produced, and at the bottom of it is a drain. So we've got a plumbing problem. That drain is clogged, and the fluid basically accumulates and pushes the brain out, and because baby's skulls are soft, the plates just pull, push apart and the head expands. It's actually helping save their life because if the skull is closed, that pressure has nowhere to go, it's painful, um, and, and mortality rates are really high. Uh, within about 72 hours. So although it's saving their life, then we have the problem of a child with a big head. And increased head size, you have problems with neck, you have problems with movement, uh, and then the social stigma on top of that. So endoscopically, we had, we had treated, we've treated children with hydrocephalus, but we weren't getting a lot of success with babies. 
Children less than one year, it was only about 40% successful. So Dr. Worf theorized, well, if there's something we can do to alter the production of CSF, at least temporarily, to allow these babies' brains, as we introduce this space with, with, a, with a, a flush of CSF, to slow down production long enough, perhaps it will give them a, a chance to, to survive this. And so he combed through the literature and, and found something called choroid plexus cauterization. And that is cauterizing the chor choroid plexus, which is this fleshy membrane in the third ventricle that produces CSF. By cauterizing it, you're slowing down the production of CSF. Before anybody gets alarmed, the body produces CSF in other parts. So it's not only, it's not restricted to the third ventricle. It's actually produced in other ventricles. It's actually produced, we found out last year, in the spinal cord as well. So the body's pretty resilient. You can slow down production here. The body compensates and produces it elsewhere. But the goal is to, to decrease production inside of that space so that we allow this procedure, this endoscopic procedure, to work. Those two therapies had never been combined before. And so in the, for the first time, we combined them in 2003. And it doubled the success rate of that intervention to about 75, 77%. <laughs> So Ben started treating all these cases of hydrocephalus, so these babies, using this procedure, and was getting really good success rates. Now, if you're wondering about the 23%, in reality, some of that 77%, some of those children actually, a small percent, actually, the ETV doesn't work, and they actually come back in for another treatment. Some of those we end up shunting. At the end of the day, about 25% of the cases we treat for hydrocephalus end up with a shunt. So for those of you that are working for Johnson & Johnson, we're not trying to obsolete the shunt. We just are trying to offer an alternative therapy. There is a place for shunts, and some children there, some children here, will, will always need to be shunted. But for what we learned out of this was there is, a, there is a viable alternative to treating hydrocephalus, especially for babies. And we treat them endoscopically with this ETB CPC procedure. And for 75% of them, it means they're not going to have a shunt. They're treated for hydrocephalus. It's a one-time surgery. It's a one-time hospital visit, lower costs on the family, on the health system. It's a lower risk for the patient. We've now done this procedure 7,000 times, and we've studied it. We've published these results. And it's gaining a lot of attention, even here in the United States. So in the beginning, you can imagine, the thought of adopting such a procedure in the United States was met with a lot of skepticism. A great, that's great for Uganda. Um, but the younger neurosurgical community is realizing, wait a minute, if this is actually negating the use of a shunt to manage hydrocephalus ethically, we should look into it for treating American babies. And so now we have American, qualified American pediatric neurosurgeons coming to Uganda to be taught by Ugandans how to do brain surgery for babies with hydrocephalus in the U.S., which is, that's unique. That doesn't happen all the time. So we're pretty proud of that. More importantly, we believe this, this is a procedure that um, will change the way that the world treats hydrocephalus. And for a lot of babies, even in the US, uh, the state of Tennessee, so Vanderbilt Children's, one of the surgeons there came to us a few years ago and learned how to do this. And he's now doing as many endoscopic procedures as they're doing shunts. And he believes that within 10 years, the state of Tennessee, this will be their primary choice of treatment. Uh, it was started out of necessity. So if we go back to 2003, shunts weren't working for us. They were a short-term solution, but they were a long-term liability. And so out of that was born a, a novel procedure that actually has ethical advantage. Why place a foreign device in a baby's head if we don't need to? And uh, that's, that's our hallmark. That's really what we do well there. Um, another unique feature to this is I mentioned babies in the U.S. are primarily born with this. It's not a... It's not an acquired condition. There is probably a one to two percent of the cases here in the U.S. that premature babies get meningitis, they acquire hydrocephalus, but most of our babies here are born with it. In Uganda and most low to middle income countries where the, the majority of the population is rural based and being born in the rural areas, um, about 60 percent plus of the cases of hydrocephalus are acquired hydrocephalus or post-infectious hydrocephalus. <clears throat> and that means that the babies are born healthy, but during that first few weeks of life, you've got a newborn baby with or without a trained birth attendant, and they're being born into less than ideal environments with mud floors and livestock around and dirty water, and they get sick. 
Some of those infections lead, you know, have an affinity for the CNS, and some of those infections lead to things like hydrocephalus. And for us, we're seeing about 800 <coughs> cases of post-infectious hydrocephalus every year in Uganda, which is by far more than any other center of the world. So we just have the funnel effect. We see a lot of babies with hydrocephalus. It gives us the opportunity to really prove this technique and also to do some very interesting research um, just because we have the volumes. <coughs> this, is a, this isn't a, an uncommon problem. This is the most common pediatric brain condition in the world, including the United States. So we may not think hydrocephalus is very, you've never heard of it, I don't know anybody. Chances are you probably do. Uh, but it, it's actually it's the most common pediatric brain condition we have. Uh, the unique feature to Uganda and other developing countries are it, it's compounded by this post-infectious piece. So in addition to all the congenital cases we have, we also have these kids that are getting it because of infection. That can be prevented. So we're talking about infectious agents, neonatal sepsis. And if we can help control that or prevent that, then perhaps we can prevent a whole lot of babies from getting sick. On average, we think about 400,000, that's a very conservative number, case, new cases in the world every year. Why don't we know about this? Like it's, that, that's almost, I don't know the numbers of TB, but I was talking to Paul, and I'm not sure that that's that much more or less than TB in the world. But we don't talk about hydrocephalus, and, and part of the reason is mortality rates for that population are very high without intervention. So it's typically, most countries that we serve do not have the, the capacity or expertise to really manage hydrocephalus. And so a lot of the children don't receive intervention, and they simply just don't survive. So you don't have the problem of legacy build up over time. Like these children, they die off within one or two years, and it just continues to, to operate that way. So we don't see it as a global health problem. But in reality, 400,000 cases a year, conservatively. Babies are contracting this or born with this and a lot of them are not surviving. And the ones that do survive, quality of life is very poor. So in addition to the ones that actually survive it, a lot of kids in, in the countries where we operate, the, the heads are, are massive. So I actually have a picture of, without being too sensational. <clears throat> That's probably a little bit extreme. Uh, there's another, you know, there's a happier child. But that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a rather large head size, and that's really middle of the road for us. So when we see children with much bigger heads than this. So then you, run, you have to ask yourself, so you run into all the neuromuscular stuff, the, the strength of the neck, and a lot of these babies are not able to crawl in the walk position just because of the head size. <coughs> the social stigma. They're not allowed into schools. They're not allowed to play with other kids. They're made fun of. Um, and a lot of them have other cognitive and developmental disability. Um, so quality of life, even for the survivors, is very poor. So the, the justification for us doing something to help address this problem is, is, is there. Let me pause there. Any questions for ATV, CPC? Yeah. Uh, this is really exciting. The, um, I mean, so on one hand, the, with the, with the hydro, the, or the original procedure with the shunt, right, my sort of, Pharma regulatory hat sort of goes. Wait a minute, like right, like local, like local clinical trials. How do you register a medical device in a country, in, in, you know, in, in a developing yeah. country? Who signed off on that? What's the government's role? On the shot? No, no, no. So, sorry. So I guess that was like the the, the, mm. was like the, the negative side. Right? Mm. But then I thought about it from the positive side, which is that like the surgery itself. So on the shot, yes, regulatory question. Mm. But equally, the lack of a regu what I what I what I would presumed to be a fairly like loose regulatory framework on this in general allows for innovations like the surgery that you sure. have, right? Um, and then allows uh, for the innovation to actually come from a place with actually a looser framework than the United States, where, mm. where you, you know. And so, I guess my question is like, where do you where do you land on that in terms of what's yeah. a what's a good balance of not falling off your side of the horse there? In terms well, I mean, so shunts. Okay. If, I, if I understood your question, let me address shunts first. So shunts are approved. That, the the Cobman Hickman shunt is the only, I think the only somebody correct me. I think it's the only approved shunt on the market. But there may be one or there may be a couple out there now. Any that Uganda is regulated. FDA. So they're regulated. They're approved for use in the United States. Right. I can't really comment about, yeah, Uganda is too loose, like if it works in the U.S., we're going to use it in Uganda as kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, they, to my knowledge, they do not have a regulatory body in Uganda to approve 
such things. Um, but if it's proven, to, if it's approved here, chances are doctors are adopting that technique to treat children. And, and we, they were shunting children in Uganda before we came. So not a lot, but there was a doctor who was placing about 50 shunts a year. So the shunt's been proven, it's been around for 45 years. Hasn't changed a whole lot. We've impregnated them with antimicrobials and all that stuff, but really the design of the shunt, the valves, is pretty much the same as it always has been. The, the innovation piece for this procedure, remember the, the ETV procedure had been done before. The difference was it was with a rigid scope, optics are good, you go straight in, you're able to create, recreate that opening. That had been done for a long time. It, that doesn't require regulatory approval per se, it's, it's part of the training rubric for a surgeon. They know how to do that. What's, dip, what's unique about this is the combination of that core plexus cauterization, which had also been done before. But when we put those two things together, we weren't able to do it with a traditional endoscope. So a traditional in, rigid endoscope is a, is a rigid scope, you go straight in. But the problem is once you go in, you're not able to, to get to the roof or the ceiling of that third ventricle to cauterize a core plexus. So it required us to use a flexible endoscope, which has a very limited application, but it has wonderful use here. So using a flexible scope, we're actually able to go in and we're actually open to reopen that aqueduct, but then we're able to bend the scope back up and cauterize the cord plexus in one surgery. And that was unique, and that had not been done before. So the two procedures separately had been done, but the coupling of them together hadn't been done. Uh, again, the regulatory body, the Ministry of Health in Uganda is excited about this. There's really not an approval process. The adoption here in the U.S. is primarily driven by, by interest and perceived demand. So most neurosurgeons 10 years ago would say, we can manage shunts. Like, why are you even exploring this as an alternative? Like, we can actually manage shunts, get patient education, family education, we get them back in, we replace the shunt, everybody goes home. So our response to that is, you're introducing a liability. And if there is a way that you can use a shuttleless procedure, then we should explore that. So the adoption process is really all about the interest on behalf of the neurosurgical community to explore something else to use. We do have 12 hospitals in the U.S. that are actually using this technique today. Um, one of those is Vandy Children's, another one's in Boston, um, but they're, they're, they're scattered throughout the United States. You know, we believe that probably 15, 20 years from now, this will be the United States choice of treatment for hydrocephalus. And as newer, more and more neurosurgeons come into the, the profession, they're gonna hear about this, they've read about it, they've, they've read our papers, they've publications, and they realize this has, this has traction, this, this actually could be viable. So, yeah, anytime you, you introduce a novel innovation like this, it, because we're not introducing a foreign object, and because it's, it's surgically based and evidence-based, doesn't need FDA approval. Yeah. yeah. The adoption here in the U.S. has mm -hmm. it been driven by some of the same concerns? Like, is it patients that maybe don't live within like an hour radius of the hospital that sort of like like okay maybe they're yeah. appropriate, or is it more just from an academic perspective of this is an interesting procedure that maybe we should? Well, let me ask you. I mean, if it was your child and if you had the chance to do something that was going to place a shunt or not place a shunt. You know, which would which would you choose? Even if you live next door to the hospital. So I, I don't think it's a question of uh, the ethical question is not necessarily those that may be further away from a center of care, but it's which would be better for the long term life of the child and patient. And the, the answer is, is it really doesn't matter how close they are to the hospital or not. You're introducing a foreign object into somebody's head that will fail, that will need replacement or revision. So I think the adoption process is primarily slowed by. A couple of things, and one of those is ego. I think anytime you develop a procedure that's not US based, there's just slow adoption. And especially in a very specialized surgical community like neurosurgery, you have neurosurgeons have proven success with the shunt. They can manage it, they know how it works, they know how it fails, they know what to do when it does. So the, 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 the people who are seeking this out are primarily younger neurosurgeons who see the need, who see the value, and realize it's okay to introduce a new methodology to treating hydrocephalus. We don't have to do it the old way, we could continue to explore other options. So most of the folks seeking us out, they're younger. Um, they're you know, four or five years in the profession, and they've, they're interested in what Dr. Worf had done, and they're coming out to, to learn from us. 
I'll give you this example of a personal friend. It's actually, he's, he's, he's best friends with my brother-in-law. They had twin boys and they were born at UCLA Children's and one of the boys had hydrocephalus. So he called me about a year and a half ago and said, I know you guys are doing something else besides placing a shunt. Can you explain that? So I explained it to him. And he went back to the folks at UCLA and they were very apprehensive and skeptical and said basically we're not comfortable doing that yet but we'll be happy to place the VP shunt. And they thought about it. He and his wife called us back again. We sent them some more publications. We <clears throat> had them read up on it. And within a few days, they said, if we wanted to have this done in the US, where would we go? So we gave them some options. But at the end, I said, you know, if it was me, Dr. Worf pioneered this procedure. He's now working at Children's Hospital Boston on staff at Harvard. That's where I would go. And so they did. They flew their newborn baby across the country to Boston. And Dr. Worf treated their weeks old baby. And he had his one year anniversary a year ago uh, from the procedure, and he's doing very well. At that point, the great thing about this endoscopic procedure is really at one year, if there hasn't been any complications, there will probably never be any complications related to hydrocephalus. You, you kind of, you pass that, that point of, of ever having a problem with this. So they're obviously really excited because their baby is now shut free and is treated for hydrocephalus and is actually meeting his milestones. But that's the, you know, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of, of courage to step outside the traditional methodology for treating a condition and going against maybe advice from a very established, reputable children's hospital. Um, but that, that will change in time. It will. And there's always going to be a, there's always going to be a mix of, of services between shunts and endoscopy. Uh, this is some, some children we're not able to treat endoscopically, and some respond better to that treatment than to shunt it. Uh, and some, yeah. So, our experience is God is the majority. So, 70 plus percent of our babies go home 13 years later. You know, in real numbers, we're talking about um, 7,500 children that have been treated endoscopically um, and are doing well over that, over that time. Frame. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you doing follow-up Yeah. Yeah, great question. So for those of you that have international experience, follow-up with any patient population is always a challenge. So it, it can be even here in the US. But in a place like Uganda, a lot of these places, um, they're not easily accessible. And you have the real barriers of cost, culture, that come into to coming back for follow-up at the hospital. So one of the things we did uh, eight years ago, the hospital's way out here. This is Kenya. We're very close to the Kenyan border. Again, pretty good distance from Kampala, a really long distance from the west and from the north. And we realized follow-up compliance was poor. So people are pretty good about coming back from the one month follow-up. Everything's still sensitive and fresh and they know the need for it. But at three months it really goes off and at six months it's almost non-existent. So we thought we have to do something to take our follow-up care closer to the communities in which we serve. So we started a mobile clinic program that is non-surgically based, but it, it provides follow-up in Emberara, up in Gulu and Lira, and also in Kampala. And that monthly mobile clinic program sees about 500 patients a month. Most of those 85% are follow-up patients. We do ID, identify some new patients or new cases, but most of those patients coming back to those clinics are follow-up patients. And again, the, the, the idea, the impetus was, if we can actually bring our follow-up care closer to the communities, then they still have to get to Mbarara, or they still have to get to Gulu, but it's not quite as much of a barrier as getting all the way out to Mbali. Um, with that being said, there's still, there's still a group of people that, for cultural reasons or economic reasons, they can't get to those places for follow-up care. And honestly, if your baby looks healthy at three months, I mean, have all of you, have any of you besides me ever stopped your antibiotic treatment early because you felt well? Like, I, th I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a unique feature. Like, baby is doing well at three months post-surgically, and I'm not going to spend the money, and I'm not going to take my time to go all the way out to the eastern side of the country if my baby looks well. So that, that will always be a challenge for us, figuring out that piece. The other, the other problem to this is a little bit more cultural. Um, in Uganda and a lot of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the way the dowry system works, and it it creates a dynamic between husband and wife, and if the husband 
abandons a family because of a child with a disability, which is not uncommon, that kind of isolates the woman uh, because she can't really return to her family because of the dowry, and his family really can't take her in because he's abandoned her. So she's kind of caught in between. And yeah, she has siblings and friends and family, and her friends and maybe neighbors, but a lot of these women are really unsupported. Their traditional support network has been removed, and there are a lot of them are young, and they're from the village, so they're undereducated, young, lower income, and they don't have a family support network around them. Then they have this baby that 60% of them, the baby was born fine, and then at one month or two months, the head starts to grow. So you try to, try to imagine this. The, the, the stuff that's wrapped up in that, the mysticism about why this is happening. Like if you don't understand you know, general medicine, let alone neuroanatomy, a head baby starts to grow, so they're scared. And then they have to come all the way out to the Mali, and if they're from other tribes in the country, there's already some stigma against coming out to Mbali. The people around Mbali were known as cannibals not too long ago. So the joke is everybody always doesn't want to go to Mbali because they're going to eat us. Um, so they show up with their babies wrapped up in blankets, uh, hidden from public because they're ashamed. And a lot of them have been abused, beaten, harassed. And they come out to this hospital, this little hospital, although my wife and I were the only non-Ugandans working at the hospital. The rest of the staff, surgeons, nurses, doctors, cooks, cleaners, we're all Ugandans. So these mothers bring their babies, and they show up at this hospital, and they're being treated with dignity and respect by fellow Ugandans, which is, that's important. It's really important because it's not a foreigner who's treating it this way, but it's their own people treating it this way. And it's with excellence and professionalism and dignity, and that's, that's, that's extremely valuable. It encourages them. Um, because they know that they've got this baby that's different and they know how to, they need to figure out how to take care of it. So follow up. The mobile clinic solution is only part of the solution for follow up. The other part is we do have, I say all that to say, we do have mothers that, families that have a challenge in bringing their babies back to the hospital for follow up or even bring them to the mobile clinic for follow up. And so we actually send staff out. We have a so the team of social workers and they actually go out into the community and they follow up with patients, especially those that are lost to follow up, which we define as anything we haven't seen them in over a year. If I pause there, going back to the ETD CPC procedure, at six months, if they, if they come back to us and we do a CT scan and the scan looks good and they're checking out all their developmental milestones, I don't need to ever see them again. They're, they're good. I mean. We have never had a recorded case of a child that's been treated endoscopically after six months have any failure rates. In, in 13 years and 7,000 times of doing this, we've never had anybody fail after six months. So at six months, if the child is doing well, I don't need to see that child again. Now, for those that are shunted, yes, that's lifetime follow-up. Child with spina bifida, a lot of them end up with hydrocephalus. Lifetime follow-up. But for that ETV population, it's not as, once they hit that six-month mark, it's not as important that we see them. We're in the middle of trying to understand how to do better follow-up, and one of those leads to your question about developmental milestones. So my wife actually has her doctorate in physical therapy. She's very passionate about this piece of it. And we're working with a tech company up in Cambridge, Mass, on developing a mobile application to where we could actually go through uh, some of the more well-established developmental tools to where I could go into a village and be able to walk through very simple questions and that would help us understand does this now does this child need further intervention, further therapy, or is this child in, in good condition? So that would be pretty novel. It's it's a very interesting we, we just met with the firm a few days ago and I think this this would have a lot of appeal not only to to our communities but probably to the broader patient population. Um, I think USAID is really interested in this, in this piece of it. Um, but we still have a lot to learn about how to do better follow-up. So, have you ever met anybody that has just a really proven, robust follow-up model? <coughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not for hydrocephalus. Not for hydrocephalus. <laughs> Can so. you talk a little bit about the volume of patients that you see there relative to what goes on in the United States and, and why yeah. there might be differences? Yeah, I'm, saying, I'm not saying this to there, there's so many variables that, that drive this, that this isn't a, 
there, there's no element of, of better than, worse than here. It's, it really is a reality that we have the funnel effect in Mbali. Nobody else is treating patients with hydrocephalus, not only in, in Uganda, but we receive patients from Kenya, South Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Congo, Rwanda. As far, you know, obviously travel is a big problem there, transportation, and then also the, the, the visa issues. But if they can get to us, we treat them. Um, but there is a funnel effect. So we're the only ones doing it. Everybody comes to us. So we have those kinds of volumes. We also don't treat a lot of trauma. We treat some tumors. But these procedures, the endoscopic procedures, the shunt procedures, these are primarily 60 to 90 minute interventions or surgeries. They don't, they don't take very long. They're minimally invasive. <clears throat> Shunt's not minimally invasive. If you've ever seen a shunt procedure, it's actually pretty barbaric. But, but endoscopic procedure is, is fairly minimally invasive. Um, they're fairly quick. A craniotomy can take eight hours. A, a trauma case can take eight hours. So we actually treat six to eight cases a day. Um, most neurosurgeons will tell you that's a really busy OR schedule, six to eight cases a day. A really busy neurosurgeon here in the US, when we look at all the requirements and regulatory atmosphere, which would say work, and also just the turnaround of getting an OR emptied, cleaned, ready for the next <coughs> case, a busy neurosurgeon does about five cases a week. So we're gonna do 30. Um, that's not a, it's not a competition, it's just a reality that it's a very busy neurosurgical unit. So we have, in our hospital, we have 38, I think I actually have a slide. In our hospital, we actually have a 38 bed pediatric neurosurgical ward. Uh, we have a 10 bed ICU, we have three theaters, we have a uh, pediatric anesthetist or an anesthesiologist, um, and we have two pediatric neurosurgeons, the only two pediatric neurosurgeons in the country um, oh. working, working with us. So it, the footprint is fairly small, not a big hospital, but again, you know, 85% utilization of our ORs, 90% plus bed occupancy. It stays busy throughout the year. Uh, we are looking for ways to actually expand that because, what, well, how many of you know this, but Uganda is unique in a couple of ways. One is it's the youngest country in the world. 57% uh, of the population is below the age of 15. Uh, fertility rates are really high, so seven-ish, 6.7, so <coughs> high sixes, low sevens, fertility rates, I think it's second only to Niger. So families have a lot of children. Uh, at 0.7, let's just say one, at one per 1,000 live births is the incidence rate for hydrocephalus. So if we do the math and people keep having seven children per family, it's about 1.6, 1.7 new ba million new babies every year. It's between three and 4,000 new cases of hydrocephalus in Uganda alone every year. And that's conservative. So we're seeing on a busy year, last year we saw about 800 cases. So we're not even seeing a quarter, 30% of the new cases in the country. Um, there's a lot of barriers to, to, to increasing that, but we do believe a larger footprint with time or having more OR capacity, more human capacity to treat this, we, we actually could probably treat more, and we're looking for ways to do that. Yeah. Um, so neurosurgeons are not really there. Uh, are you working with the government to see if you can train some more up? Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you talked to the medical school? And Good politically charged question. So, <laughs> so there are, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're not, this is not a, the reason we have the only two pediatric neurosurgeons are because we're a pediatric center. So the, the Malago, which you visited, the National Referral Hospital, does have a neurosurgery unit. And they will treat children. They actually do shunt a few children every year, about 100 cases a year. The, the neurosurgeons there, there are three, four-ish. Um, <laughs> They don't have pediatric fellowships, and that's important. Um, and a couple, more than more than two of them, maybe even three of them, I'm not sure they even have neurosurgical training. They are general surgeons doing doing neurosurgery, which is not uncommon in a lot of countries. You have general surgeons; the need is there. So you know, Alan, I know you're a general surgeon, but can you place a few shunts, or can you handle this head trauma? And it's just out of necessity that people are doing that. It's not ideal, but they may I mean, they do the best they can. They're not set up to treat 800 cases of hydrocephalus fever. 
They're just not set up to do that. So, uh, as Pascal intimated, there is a shortage of neurosurgical capacity in the country. There is a new training program that's been introduced three years ago through McAreary, which is the, the main university there. And we're eager to see the outcome of that training before we hitch our wagon. Um, we do believe that at some point that we will play a role in uh, a more robust training program for the country. Right now, we're really serving only as a rotation site for pediatrics, for pediatric neurosurgery. So the idea is once they get closer to completion, which this year will be the first, those third year residents will actually come out and spend a period of time in our hospital in pediatrics. So we're hoping that depending on the outcome and quality of, of, of training, you know, if, if it's at a certain level that we're acceptable with, then we'll continue to offer that service. But if we're getting residents that you know, don't know basic neuroanatomy, probably not going to waste our time showing them how to do ETV CPC. So with that aside, we do have an international training program that's called the Cure Hydrocephalus Surgical Training Program. And that is training already qualified neurosurgeons from other countries how to do this for children in their home countries. So we talked about the United States, but as importantly, our surgeons coming from uh, other African countries and other countries around the world. So we've trained 26 surgeons from 18 different countries over the past six years on how to do this. They come out to us, they spend two to three months, which is not an insignificant commitment. They train with us. Once they demonstrate competency, we actually send them back with the equipment they need to be able to do this, and they go home and start treating patients in their home countries. And those sites, they are non-cure hospital sites, so um, these are typically public hospitals in, in these countries, and we're supporting a neurosurgeon to treat children who have hydrocephalus within that existing framework. There are some challenges with that. Um, but we, we're hopeful that in time we're going to find partners that we can work with. I'll be honest, some of them, they get back and, you know, within three months we get an email and say, you know, the hospital doesn't have power or there's no anesthesia machines or I can't get, you know, whatever, saline. We can help to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, the, ho the host country and host hospital has to assume some responsibility for, for providing surgical care for children. On the, the more positive extreme, we, uh, a surgeon we trained five years ago on how to do this is back home in Tanzania and he's treating 450 kids a year in a government center with really good, with as good of outcomes as we're seeing in Bali. So that, that's, a, that's a win for us. We, we're now exporting this methodology for treating hydrocephalus to other countries that have this kind of population. Cool. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about the financial viability of that one and then also of the Cure Network in, in general? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're very traditional. So we, we're a Christian mission. We started out as a faith-based, sorry, we are a faith-based mission. Our, our founder set it up, our founder's a surgeon. And I don't know how many of you ever worked with surgeons, but surgeons are, are independent thinkers. And they have to be, right? You don't want your... You don't want a cardiothoracic surgeon, you know, taking a questionnaire about what he should do next while he's treating a patient. They typically operate very independently. And that kind of bleeds into the management style. And, and I think our founder um, had a vision for what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it, and that's the way we did it. And I think a lot of times in management, especially in the nonprofit sector, and probably the private sector as well, good management requires interdependency. And, and collaboration, and we're, we're getting input from other folks and we're making these decisions. So for the first 15 years of CURE, um, our founder and president did things really well, but he did it how he perceived we needed to do it. And we've grown in time. We're, we're in, the, in the middle of a transition from being a traditional mom and pop organization and how those decisions are made and functions are allocated to being a more formal, incorporated organization that's trying to do things in a more grown-up way. I don't know how to say that politely. But with that, um, with that comes also the, the, the funding model for the organization. So historically, in the beginning, the organization was primarily funded by Dr. Harrison and his family. 
And he brought along some like-minded folks and put them on his board, and they funded the organization for another couple of years. And that kind of just continued to, to expand. Um, high capacity donors were coming in and they liked what we were doing. They were friends of the, the family or friends of this other fa these other families. And it just kind of built this way over the first 10 years. So in 2005, 2006, we're about 10 years old and about 90% of our funding came from about 10% of our donors here in the United States. About 90% of our expense needs were from the private sector of the United States. So at that point in 2006, we had eight hospitals. Um, it, we were, the organization was, it was about a $20 million a year organization. And the majority, and I think this is 90%, <coughs> I don't have that exact number, but I, I'm guessing it's around 90% of our income needs were coming from the private sector here in the United States. Private sector being primarily individuals. About 85% of our private sector funding is individuals. 80%, 15% comes from foundation, and 5% from other businesses, churches. That has changed. So over the past 10 years, we have our funding model is now down to about 40% of our donors are funding about 80% of our operations. Additionally, our hospitals have started to replicate what we've done in Uganda. So we were not the first, but probably the first to achieve some success in introducing a fee for service. So historically, as like a lot of faith-based nonprofits do, we just offer things for no fee, for no contribution. It's as on a charity basis, because we believe that that increases access. It's obviously the most affordable, uh, and so we. That's the way we operated. Obviously, we know it's not sustainable, and we realize that as well as we begin to establish more hospitals and these hospitals become more expensive to operate. We realize we have to change the way we've done it. So we introduced a fee-for-service model in Uganda in 2007. And that wasn't easy. We'd been there for six years. The community in which we're serving, the country, had come to expect free service from us. Many of our staff, that's that's what they believed we should be doing. Because they're Ugandan and they thought we should be offering free <coughs> service for other Ugandans. But I think for me, the primary impetus for introducing a fee for service was to conduct a transaction. So that mother, father, they bring their baby <coughs> to me, I'm offering something of value, they need to contribute toward that. And that transaction transfers ownership. And we had the vision to realize, I think that transaction will actually promote better long-term outcomes because then I'm taking the ownership of the health care of that baby and I'm giving it to you and in time you're going to take better care of your baby because of that. And that's, we're, we're showing that. It's anecdotal at this point, but we are showing where parents that have actually contributed to the cost of their health care for their children, those children are actually doing better. And so we actually published a paper three years ago that was part of it. The other part of it was CBR, which is community-based rehabilitation. So we look at community-based rehabilitation. Remind me, I'll send you this publication. Have I already sent it to you? We look at community-based rehabilitation in Uganda. Even the perception of having a CBR group for patients that come in from our hospital, the idea that there's somebody who's following up with you, even if they never follow up with you, but there is the potential for follow-up in your community those communities have the best outcomes with their babies. So they believe that somebody else is also checking in on us. We're accountable. Part of that paper is also on the fee for services, looking at transactions and, and patients actually, parents that contribute to the health care of their children typically take better care of them. There's an investment made. So what started in 2007 is actually resulted in a new sustainability model for us as an organization because we were only earning a couple thousand dollars a year. So if you go back to 2007, it cost us about a little under $900,000, 800 and change, to run this operation. We're getting a couple thousand dollars a year toward that in contributions. We started this fee for service in 2007. We had a couple of painful years to work through that change in the community and with our staff. Last year, that, that, um, that approach is now resulting in $205,000 $205, in revenue for the hospital. 
Hospital is basically the same framework. Um, there is an extra, there's an additional OR, a few extra staff. It's only costing us about a million dollars a year, and I can tell you how we got to the 880 to only one million in eight years, but we had that recession in 2008 and which forced us to operate a little bit more cleanly. So we did trim costs during that period and allowed us to stay relatively, our cost per surgery and cost per patient stay actually decreased. So since 2007 to 2015, we've actually seen a decline because we've just been able to control expenses better. So I just wanted to kind of address that momentarily. What is the need for service? It's sliding. So it is, and I don't say that with any, there's nothing cheeky about it. Um, we employ a team of a department of social workers. Everybody contributes. So patient comes into the hospital, a social worker is going to spend between 30 and 60 minutes with every patient. And they go through the process of understanding where that patient's coming from. So there's a whole lot of questions in land ownership, occupation, husband, children, school, et cetera. And from that, they are able to reach an agreement with that family, how much can they contribute on that visit? The cost for this procedure is costing me, the surgery alone is about $500 in labor and material, but when you add in the hospital stay and everything else that goes with it, it costs us about $2,000 for brain surgery and seven days in the hospital. So I'm not saying we could do that here, but I can tell you that $2,000 doesn't get you very far in one of our hospitals here. So we're really happy that we've been able to control that cost to the organization. But $2,000 is out of reach for most, most people in, in the countries where we serve. So we're trying to understand how do we make it affordable, like how far down can we go to where access is not impeded. And most of our patients are contributing between $50 and $100. And that's still a lot of money. Um, we do have, I'm taking a lot of timeouts here. We do have, there is a small percentage of mothers, of families, that especially mothers that have been abandoned and they're young, they don't own land, they have nothing to barter with or sell, and they truly show up with the last dime they spent to get out there. For those few, and I mean few, it's probably less than 8%, five to 8% of those mothers, we have a special provision for them where we actually contribute on their behalf. And again, it's to stay true to our, to our policy that everybody contributes. In our hospital in Uganda, no, no child has ever been turned away. Any child that has needed neurosurgery has always been treated, and that will continue to be. That's why we're there, that's what we do. We're not gonna turn away because of the inability to pay a fee. We also believe that everybody should pay, and so there's a bit of rub there, and sometimes it's difficult conversations with others, especially those that knew we were free and now we're not. That's becoming less and less of a, of a, of a problem just because we're, we've been doing this now for eight years and people know I'm giving them something and I'm receiving a valuable quality service. So on average, $50 to 100 bucks is a contribution. It means we have to have come up with the 1900 bucks, 1950 to, to complete that operation. About half of that money, about half of that $1,900, we actually earn income in the in country or, and or locally fundraise. So in addition to the contributions we're receiving from our patients, um, we also offer fee for service for a CT scan. We have the only one of two CT scans on that side of Uganda, which I don't know how many of you are familiar. You know, the, the source of the River Nile is in Uganda. And it starts at a place here called Jinja. It goes all the way up to uh, South Sudan. So on this side of the river, is eastern and northern Uganda. It's a population of about 18 million people. We have the only, up until about a year ago, we had the only CT scan and we have the only pediatric anesthesiologist for 18 million people. So, but we have, a, we, that's a service that patients that don't have brain conditions actually need access. They need a CT scan. They come to us, they pay us $100, they get a CT scan. We have a great lab, so people that need lab tests on an outpatient basis, we charge for that. All those revenue opportunities create about 35, 40% of our income needs at that hospital. We raise a little bit of money in Kampala. Uh, in the end, we, about 60%, 50, a little bit less than that, of our income needs are 
met through fundraising from the United States. That hospital is pretty unique in that. Our other hospitals, um, many of our, nobody's asked me yet why we're in the Bali. Why are you in Bali? So Uganda was our second hospital. And for those of you with international experience, a lot of things are in capital cities. So especially when you're talking about specialized care or surgery, like why wouldn't you be in Kampala or near Kampala? The answer is if we had to do it again today, we probably would. But 15, 16 years ago, um, let me see graphs or maps. 16 years ago, there was a war going on in the north. And Gulu and Lara were in the heart of that. This place, Soroti, just right there, was about the closest you could get to the north without being in the north. And we had uh, the Speaker of Parliament at the time uh, was from the Mbali area, and they were able to work a deal with the Uganda government to give us the land to be able to build a hospital. So that's, there's nothing magic about it. There's a relationship. We perceived, incorrectly, that being closer to the communities that had more impoverished populations, which are typically you see a higher incidence of disability, we were going to be closer to the population that people wanted to serve. The reality is that's, that's not true. Um, we actually should be based, in most cases, in the capital city or near the capital city. But back then, that was our line of thought, and we decided to, to set up the hospital in Bali. How did I get off on that? So your other, your other specialty hospitals, talking about mm. financial viability yep. as well. So now that we build, we build hospitals, they're usually in major urban centers. Most of the time, they're capital cities. And many of them have the opportunity to offer a fee-for-service in addition to pediatric care. So nearly all of our, our hospitals offer subsidized pediatric care, but they also offer, it's a dual model, they also offer private fee-for-service for fee-paying fee adults. And you know, you look at a case like Malawi, so we're in Blantyre, Malawi. You know, there's a, there's a fairly large, mostly English population there, uh, expat population, and they've been there for a long time. They're getting older. We have a pediatric orthopedic hospital they need hips replaced and knees replaced. And we have the expertise to be able to do it. We charge a premium for that. And uh, you know, over the past 10 years, we've built that service up. And that hospital is pretty much self-sufficient. The income they earn off of that is able to subsidize care for about 1,800 children every year. We're doing the same thing in Kajabi, Kenya. We actually, a little bit different, but in Kenya, we actually set up, because the hospital's about an hour outside of Nairobi, we actually set up a, a a clinic in Nairobi that allows our staff to go into Nairobi and actually offer the same service for adults for a fee that helps go to subsidize kids in, in Kajabi. Most of our hospitals are now being intentionally set up that way to have this dual model, offer a high quality service over here for one population to care for the pediatric cases on this side. So, I mean, you, you, Kenya is now 20 years old. Um, Uganda was set up in 2000, 2001. Um, our most recent hospital was built in the Philippines, um, and it's just barely about a year old, not even a year old yet. So, um, in Africa, I think our newest, excuse me, uh, our newest hospital is actually in West Africa, in Niger. Um, it was opened up four years ago, five years ago. So the rest of the the rest of the African hospitals have been there for about ten years, eight to ten years or more. I think I understood how Malawi became so self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, how what that kind of looked like and if you would see that impact in Uganda. Yeah. So in Malawi, it's actually my first my first assignment with Cure was to go to Malawi and introduce the dual model. And we knew the need was there because we were getting all these requests from adults to offer this service. We had a an American physio, a physical therapist who's working there, who's already doing kind of private service anyway for, for a PT basis. We're like, why don't we expand this to, to surgery? And the surgeons there were a little bit reticent at the time because they were English and they joined the mission because they believed in helping children. So now we're asking them to contribute part of their time to offer service for people who are paying money. So I, I can understand the missional side. If they join this to do that, and then they're asked to be doing this, which they could do in their home country, so there was, a little bit of, there was a little bit of pushback initially, but I think now most of our surgeons understand in order for us to be self-sufficient to, to help more children, 
We actually have to have to, have to find revenue opportunities to be able to make that happen. But there was, it wasn't easy in the beginning, but we knew there was a population there and we knew the, the market had a need for it. Nobody, there wasn't another orthopedic surgeon in Malawi at the time. And so what are people doing? Expats are leaving the country. So if we can offer a service in the country and build that as a reputable quality service, then the idea was they would be able to, to seek us out. So I think, you know, obviously we had to earn trust. Um, we had to prove that we were competent and that, that took time, but it, within three to four years, they were seeing a pretty good return on that. And after about, that was 2005, I would say by 2011, they were generating enough income to meet most of their needs. Now, probably a dirty little secret, I'll have to edit this part out. There are some overhead costs to running these hospitals that we don't task the hospitals with. So the office that we have here in the United States, which provides support, IT, marketing, HR, our hospitals are tasked with, with, with contributing toward that overhead cost. So there's a cost to running these hospitals that's not on their books that we don't charge them for. Um, but we raise money for that here in the U.S. to provide that level of support. So, but, but their day-to-day -day operations, they're pretty much able to pay for their own. And the same for Kenya. There's still a need, obviously. I think where we're at now, the season we're in now is so your question about Uganda, I want to be realistic about Uganda. We're located in Mbali. Like there, there's just the ceiling about how much revenue we can generate being located that far away from the, the, the center of the country. Um, it's realistic for places like Addis Ababa. It's realistic for places like Lusaka. Probably not realistic for Mbali. Furthermore, there's not many elective neurosurgical conditions. Like I can't think of a brain condition that's elective. I mean, if, if so, I would have had my head shrunk a long time ago. But most neurosurgical conditions are urgent, acute, sometimes chronic, uh, and usually emergency situations. Orthopedics, on the other hand, are often elective. So, you know, our patients come to us, we don't treat them, a lot of them don't do well. In the worst case, a lot of them will die. Orthopedics, you don't treat them, the condition persists, but you could treat them again in three months or a year, or maybe even longer. So a lot, of elect, a lot of orthopedic cases are much more elective, and that creates a different type of model for, in terms of, of private service. So I just want to be realistic about Mbali. I don't think we're ever going to reach 100% sustainability in Mbali with this model. I think there are other things I was talking to Paul about that we could probably leverage in country to, to produce or generate enough revenue to, to offset that, that complete expense but probably not just through surgeries for adults or fee-paying patients. It's probably got to be a little bit more outside the box. Um, supply chain management, biomedical engineering, all that stuff that we could probably maybe perhaps leverage to generate some income um, to pay for surgeries. But the traditional model we're using now probably won't get us as far as we want to be in, in Uganda. Yeah. A couple questions about the dual model. Um, one, how cost competitive is that, given that you're subsidizing somebody else's care? How cost competitive is it with other private clinics of similar quality? The second one is yeah. how, much, how much does that dual model actually serve as a marketing tool to bring people in you know, because their payment is contributing towards? You know, it's probably it's two great questions. It, it really is country by country uh, dependent. I know in Kajabi and Malawi, there's real traction with people understanding that, hey, by going to this hospital, not am I only getting a quality service, but I'm actually subsidizing care for kids. And we do try to use that as a marketing tool. Um, in Uganda, it hasn't really taken off yet because we're just, we don't have the private patient business built up enough for us to be able to leverage that. Um, your other question, remind me again. Just how cost competitive is it in general? Yeah, we're. That's also country dependent. I know in Kenya we're priced pretty competitively to what we charge for orthopedic care is about what somebody would pay in a private hospital market. In Uganda, we're far below. And that may change. That was kind of our decision when I was there, is we felt like what people were charging in Kampala, in Kampala for, for neurosurgery, was creating accessibility problems for a lot of Ugandans. And so I'll just tell you, I'll tell you what it is. I mean, it would, private hospitals in Kampala were charging doctors from Malago, 
were going to private clinics and they were charging $6,000 just to look at a case, a neurosurgical case. So we were charging $2,000. And the reason was we could more than cover our cost with that, but also 2,000 to 6,000, there's a whole big group of people that can't afford six, but they can afford two. And we just didn't wanna, we didn't wanna exclude the people that really needed, adults that needed neurosurgical care. We weren't gonna treat them for free, because then that would compromise our ability to treat children. But we also didn't wanna set it at the market rate because then we felt like you create accessibility problems for a lot of other people. So I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That was our feeling at the time. That may change, I'm sure, as economies change and other players come into this, but, but at the time, that was our decision. But in Kenya, I think they're fairly competitive with what's on the market. And again, part of it's the nature of the surgery. It's elective versus non-elective surgery. So you can charge a premium for elective cases if people want it, they'll pay for it. But for non-elective cases and urgent, urgent situations, I'm not gonna haggle over a couple thousand dollars of somebody's life as a lot. So that's just me. Other questions? So I see in a couple of places, it looks like Ethiopia and Zambia, you also have, you have um, hydrocephalus and clubfoot clinics. Your eyes do are better than mine. <laughs> well, I'm squinting to see, but. So do those clinics, like, do the orthopedic clinics help subsidize the neuro clinics there? Not yet, that's an okay. interesting question though. Like, would there be a so, demand for that in Uganda to have a? An yeah, for those of you trying to make this out, I'm really sorry this is so poor. The H is, is a hospital, and the little foot is clubfoot, and then the little drop of water is hydrocephalus. It's a hydrocephalus center. So I think that covers it, except for Egypt. Um, so in those countries where we have both, which actually there's only two right now, Zambia and Uganda, we actually have orthopedics and neurosurgery. They are not cross-subsidizing, uh, but I think it's primarily because in Zambia, I'm sorry, Uganda, we're not doing orthopedics. In Zambia, we're not doing that because we're not even reaching the level of sustainability for either one of those programs. So I think if we were you know, operating in a surplus in orthopedics, I'm sure it would help out the rest of the hospital, but we haven't reached that point yet. Is that a goal though? It could be. I mean, I think right now, honestly, we're just trying to ramp up the, the neurosurgical service in Zambia. Like we're literally in month six of doing that. So actually Ugandan is, a Ugandan neurosurgeon is in Zambia helping us build up the neuro program in Zambia. So he was our medical director for 10 years and he agreed to go to Zambia and help us build the program there. And, Good questions. Other questions or thoughts? We have a few minutes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So where do you find resources, human resources to do all this? Mm. It, do you have any internal training programs for nurses? And no, those are, so really good questions. And obviously location does compromise, our, for Uganda, location does compromise our ability to recruit staff. Um, you know, a lot of young professionals, they want to be where the center of life is. And a lot of, in a lot of cases, that's the capital city. Typically, your better earning jobs are in bigger cities. The nightlife is there. There's a better quality of living. So to get somebody to work up country, which is what we call when they leave Kampala, it, it's not easy to recruit staff to, to draw them out of the capital and get to work for us there. But I would say this is true probably for most of our hospitals, even the ones based in capital cities, is we reach a point where we have a critical mass of staff that believe in the missional side of our organization and we pay them a competitive wage and by competitive I mean in Uganda we're barely paying what government pays so all of our staff could definitely earn more money somewhere else they're not in it for that but we do want to pay them a fair wage and if we offer them a fair wage and we offer them the the support and tools they need to do their job and then you throw in the missional commitment we have a really strong retention rate with staff. So it's not the money, but they have what they need to do their jobs and they believe in what they're doing. So at this point, after, I think it's getting a lot easier for us to recruit in our older hospitals because we've built up the reputation of what we're doing. People know that our hospitals are offering a high quality service and they're helping children, which a lot of folks want to be a part of. And so we have an easier time recruiting at our older hospitals. Let me pause there and say there are events that happened. We're in the middle of one right now in Zambia. The Zambian government has raised, tripled nurses' wages. 
it's tough for us to compete with that, at least on the short term. So we have a, we've, we've had an exodus of nurses from our hospital in Zambia, and we're going to have to find creative ways to staff that hospital with nurses, including going over to Zimbabwe and Malawi to, to recruit nurses to come work in Zambia. So there are always some challenges with recruitment. I, it's, it's probably one of the biggest vulnerabilities that we have in our network is recruiting the right staff uh, to put them in the right places. Um, I think part of it is we have the missional attraction. We've had a lot of grace to find the right people over time. And a lot of the people I've come to work for us have just been the right people for the right time. Um, I, I'd love to take credit for that, but I don't think that I can. Um, the other question is more on the job training <coughs> is yes. So a lot of times the staff that we recruit were trained to a certain standard that is not acceptable in our setting. And so we typically have to undo some of that training and then retrain them. And that, that takes time. Um, you know, our, our nurses go through a three month orientation period before they actually contribute to any patient care. And that's primarily for that reason is we want to make sure that we've trained them the way that we need them to operate and work in our setting. Um, yeah, we do a, we do a, we've trained over 6,000 healthcare workers through our network with on the, on the job training and or sponsorship for, for training programs outside of our hospitals. In the few minutes that's left, can you just say a few words about the club program? Yes, I'm, I'm less, I'm learning, because I've been focused on the hydrocephalus side of the organization for the past eight years, I'm learning, still learning about our club foot program, but we do, uh, we are the world's largest club foot provider, and we, we really specialize in the non-surgical treatment of club foot. So there was a procedure that was developed, not by us, but, but really we took this procedure and have expanded it, um, called the Ponsetti Technique, and it is, is, is serial casting, it was developed by Dr. Ponsetti at the University of Iowa. So Dr. Ponsetti uh, would, would basically, for, for a newborn with club foot, instead of treating them surgically, would actually serial cast them over a period of six weeks and found that actually a lot of these children with club foot don't need surgery, they just need this casting technique over a period of six weeks. And so now we have, through our club foot program, India is our largest, um, and we're seeing no, I'm not even going to say the number because I don't have it. I don't know for sure yet. But I know it's in the tens of thousands of children every year with club foot are coming to these clinics. And most of them are being treated with this Ponsetti technique, which is minimally invasive. And I say minimally invasive is sometimes they need a tenotomy, uh, which is a clipping of the tendon. A, a non-surgeon can do that. A technician level can actually do that. And then the rest of it is just casting. Compliance, of course, is a big problem with this because it's, it's a procedure that has to be done and redone over a period of six weeks. So the follow-up and that compliance piece is so important for our club foot program. And we have staffed that program with those types of resources to help us improve follow-up to make sure the compliance is good. There's no point in doing a serial cast for three weeks. Like you need to do it for a, for a certain period of time for this to be successful. But it's an exciting program. It's, it's children that don't need to come to the hospital, they just need to come to the clinic. It's, really, it's relatively low overhead because we don't need a surgeon. Uh, we typically just need a technician and then a couple of follow-up workers, probably a clerk, and they're able to, to handle this. You don't need all the expensive equipment. It's plaster of Paris, it's a few small instruments, and we can actually operate these clinics fairly inexpensively and allows us to, I think we're in 29 of 30 plus states in India. Um, and the government's very supportive of, of what we're doing there. We now have 19 countries where we're operating where we don't have a hospital, where we have a club foot program. So it's allowed CURE to continue our vision and mission of helping children with disability without necessarily having the overhead cost of a, of a full-blown hospital. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I, this is a great example. We hear about reverse innovations great example of that um, and of a uh, hospital, a healthcare provider that's um, creating mm -hmm. sustainability. We talk a lot about Arvin here and mm -hmm. a lot of work with them here, but um, I thought this is another good example to, to hear about. So thanks very much for coming. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.